Isaiah Mosley is officially a Missouri Tiger, and it appears he is exactly the type of player that Dennis Gates' roster needed for the 2023 season. Also, I've talked a lot about football permanent opponents in the SEC. Well, what about basketball? Could Kentucky be an option? Well, all this and more coming up right now on Locked on Mizzou. You are Locked on Mizzou, your daily podcast on the Missouri Tigers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, all you true sons and daughters, I'm John Miller, your Mizzou mafioso and the central scrutinizer of Missouri Tigers football and basketball. Thanks for making Locked on Mizzou your first listen, especially here in the offseason where, yes, we have some sporadic episodes, but don't worry, come August, we'll be back to five days a week. But obviously, when Isaiah Mosley, formerly of Missouri State, when he commits to your Missouri Tigers, well, this is a huge deal. And for those of you who are uninitiated, I'm sure most of you have probably heard at this point. So don't worry, we'll get to what this actually means. But just off the top here, Isaiah Mosley, a six foot five guard from Missouri State the past a few seasons. He was formerly from Rockbridge High School, where he and current Kansas Jayhawk Dewan Harris won the state championship for Rockbridge. Of course, Columbia, Missouri's own there. And well, I'll be honest, probably one of the biggest misses by Conzo Martin, having a kid that good in your backyard. Though, to be fair, obviously, Mosley ended up at Missouri State, so we weren't the only ones who passed up on him. But I will say, I do happen to know for a fact that Rockbridge, people around that program, were not too thrilled with Conzo Martin when he also, not only Mosley, that situation, but also Dewan Harris, kind of a late offer there. He ultimately ends up going to Kansas. So some real big missed opportunities there from Conzo, but you know what? You wait long enough, sometimes good things happen. Dennis Gates getting a second chance to bring Isaiah Mosley home to Mizzou and does exactly so. And my goodness, you look at his numbers last season, 20 points a game, 50% from the field, including 42% from the three-point line. Yeah, those numbers will certainly play on any basketball team at any level. But of course, the immediate and obvious question would be if you're going to take the the sort of bearish side of the ledger, well, will this translate? Will will the Missouri Conference and the Missouri Valley Conference, excuse me, their player of the year, Isaiah Mosley, will that game translate to the SEC? That's the first obvious question. Well, to me, the obvious answer, you watch him play for a little while at Missouri State, the answer is yes, absolutely. Because... Even though those numbers, those those shooting percentages in particular, are so impressive, you almost want to take them with a grain of salt. But God, the God's honest truth is, it's not as though Mosley's sitting out there and shooting wide open shots that some creator is making for him. If you're if you're an NBA fan, you've been watching the playoffs. Maybe think somebody like Dorian Finney Smith on the Dallas Mavericks. Well, you may have not have heard of him, but you've heard of Luka Doncic. That's my point. On paper, Smith might have better shooting than Doncic, but in reality, Doncic is hitting a lot of harder shots because he's getting what I like to call shot clock grenades. And boy, I tell you what, Isaiah Mosley down in Springfield was the recipient of dozens and dozens of shot clock grenades the past few seasons. In other words, hey, Isaiah, oh, there's five seconds left on the clock. The offense is completely bogged down. Well, here you go, pal, make something happen. And more often than not, Isaiah Mosley in those situations made something happen. Based on those numbers, he was doing it quite well. Isaiah Mosley, considered by on three, the number one overall player in the transfer portal. I've got to think he's the best perimeter scorer that transferred this offseason. So especially at this point in the process, especially on a guy that, gosh, maybe a week or two ago, it didn't seem likely at all that he was going to come to Missouri. It seemed much more likely that he was going to join his former Rockbridge teammate, Dewan Harris, in Lawrence, Kansas. Well, my goodness, this has got to be 
Dennis Gates biggest recruiting victory so far and he's had quite a few of them so far but to me this one is the biggest especially for 22 23 Mosley should only be around for this one season I would imagine but you know what this was looking like the type of roster that Dennis Gates was setting up here trying to raise the floor for next season as a bridge year hopefully to to the following year when Gates will have even more time to put together a roster, especially on the high school side of recruiting, him and Charlton Young together seem to be quite the team. So having a full season to actually recruit high school players, implement his system fully, you know, in a year or two, you're not going to be seeing so many former, so many former Cleveland State and Horizon League players. Again, these are bridge type players that have lots of experience in college basketball, and possibly just as importantly, in Dennis Gates' system, especially his defensive system. So to me, I thought Missouri was looking like a team that was probably a long shot to make the tournament, although a team I felt like was going to be better than it was last season, Conzo Martin's last season. But now, you throw Isaiah Mosley into the fold. To me, the previous roster before Isaiah Mosley got in there had a gaping hole in terms of a perimeter score and just shooting in general. And guess what? You've kind of filled both of those needs with one guy. And again, what are you going to do late shot clock? Well, I think you just give it to Isaiah Mosley, hand him the grenade, and see what happens. Because so far, he's been willing to dive on all of them. Bottom line is, before Missouri added Mosley, I thought the 22-23 roster Looked solid, but it just didn't really look like a tournament team to me. But now with Mosley in the fold, I think you're looking at a team that has that upside for sure. Not making any guarantees here by any stretch of the imagination, but obviously with Kobe Brown coming back, he was one of the better players in the Southeastern Conference. I just think you're looking at a much stronger roster all of a sudden. I think he's also a, a force multiplier too. Now all of a sudden, Kobe Brown doesn't have to be your number one scorer. That's going to take so much pressure off of him, and I just think you're going to see him probably have his best season as a Tiger next season because we all know Kobe's a very, very solid player. I just don't think he's really necessarily cut out to be your number one scorer, your primary ball handler, or somebody you run the, the offense through. Any of those type of things don't really describe Kobe Brown, but at the same time, the guy takes almost nothing off the table. Not a great outside shooter, but other than that, man, he, he brings about everything else positive to the game that you could imagine. So to me, you give some of those tough late clock, late offense options to Isaiah Mosley, well, not only are those better shots for Missouri, but I think that just takes tremendous pressure off of Brown and allows him to do all the things that he does best. So yeah, could Missouri make the tournament next year? I think it could happen. I really do. And well... My goodness, if they could have possibly gotten Jamarian Sharp, I'd have been, I almost would have been guaranteeing it at that point because I don't know who else is out there at center, but Missouri still does have a bit of a hole there in a Trevin Brazil sized hole, I would say, in terms of somebody in the lane who can protect the lane, block shots, be an intimidator in the paint, all that good stuff. Certainly could have been Jamarian Sharp. Obviously, he went back to Western Kentucky, but Missouri obviously going to still be in the market for another big guy if they can find one. And as I mentioned earlier, my previous two episodes focused quite heavily on possible SEC permanent opponents for Mizzou football. Well, you know what? We're not even totally sure on the format of what SEC football scheduling is going to look like, but basketball does have a final decision. So you know what? Let's talk about what SEC hoops is going to look like this coming season, plus who I would like to see Missouri's permanent rivals be, including maybe the Kentucky Wildcats, just maybe. But first, I want to tell you about Built Bar. Ah, yes, the greatest protein bar of all time. Don't you just love that chewy, chocolatey brownie? Well, how about a caramel brownie with caramel swirled on top? Ah, yes, so good. Well, what if I tell you you can have all that with chewy, chocolatey deliciousness, deliciousness, excuse me, plus 17 grams of protein. Well, you're in luck because these car caramel brownie bars are available at built.com right now. And you got to act fast because they are a fan favorite. So you know what? 
The best part is not only are these things relatively healthy with 130 calories, 17 grams of protein, and only four grams of sugar, well, they're still covered in 100% real chocolate. They taste great. So you know what? You can't go wrong. It's truly the best of both worlds. So go to Built.com. Use the promo code LOCKED15 to get 15% off your next order. Once again, 15% off at Built.com when you use the promo code LOCKED15. Hey, thanks for listening, as always. And you know what? If you like this show, please do me a favor. And you know what? If there's some things you think I can do better, please go to LockedOnPodcast.com slash survey. Again, let me know what I'm doing well. Let me know some things you'd like to see improved upon on the show. And here's what's in it for you. You get a chance to win one of $1,000 Ticketmaster gift cards. Not bad, right? Possible chance at 100 bucks just for a couple minutes of your time. So thank you so much for going to LockedOnPodcast.com slash survey. Once again, thanks for your help. So before we get to the permanent rival basketball discussion, another thing was decided at these SEC meetings regarding hoops, and that's that all 16 teams, again, once Oklahoma and Texas are officially in the fold here, all 16 teams are going to be in the single elimination SEC postseason basketball tournament. But consistent with the current format, there's still going to be the bye week. So the top four seeds are going to rem- st- still keep getting the first two rounds of the tournament off, which on one hand, okay, great. I'm glad there's some incentive to get those top four seeds in the regular season. But honestly, if you got 16 teams, that happens to be the perfect amount for a single elimination tournament. Why not just have, have them play? Just have them all play. Four in a row, you got to win that many. Fine and dandy. Uh, to me, that, that that is much more interesting, too, and it eliminates the, the first day of the SEC tournament where you just get the bottom feeders playing against each other, attended by basically 2,000 people most of them being media and ushers, I think, based on the attendance I've seen on those games on TV lately. But I don't know. To me, you have that first day, at least you've got your top teams. You've got Kentucky and Tennessee there and whoever's in in Florida, whoever's in the top five or four of the league. You're actually going to get a lot more buzz and interest in that first day. Maybe that's just too many games to play in one day, I suppose. But hey, how about four games. You got eight games to play that first day. Well, put it in two venues. How about that? You can sell twice as many tickets or I don't know. There's got to be something we can do here because to me, all of every, every scenario I just threw out there off the top of my head, whatever holes you want to poke in them, it's still more interesting than that first SEC tournament game when 11 plays 14 and 12 plays 13. Even the teams who are involved in those games barely even want to be there. So if anything, I would have just eliminated that day completely. Hey, guess what? If you don't finish in the in the top 12 of the conference, well, you don't make the tournament. Sorry. Cry me a river. That would have been preferable to this. So that's one complaint. But anyway, I've talked enough about that. The decision did come down, though, about permanent rivals. That, here's what's going to happen. The men's side is going to have two permanent rivals, and then there'll be one rotating opponent that you play home and away every year. So again, that one rotating opponent, maybe one year you'll play Ole Miss twice, and the next year you'll play Mississippi State twice. But for Missouri, really those two permanent opponents seem pretty obvious, I have to say. I think Missouri and Arkansas, that rivalry is going to stay alive. It seems like both programs would like that to continue. It also seems like the league office would like that to continue. So that's a pretty obvious one. It's also the closest team geographically to Columbia. No problem with any of that. And you know what? With Oklahoma joining the fold, I would actually say that's a pretty obvious one as well because clearly Missouri and Oklahoma have a ton of history in basketball going over the last oh, I don't know, 80 years or so, how long have Missouri and Oklahoma been playing basketball? I'd say at least that long off the top of my head, despite the relative off period of the last 10 years or so. Now, here's the thing. Actually, Missouri and Oklahoma, believe it or not, a better rivalry than it is on the gridiron because guess what? 
for the most part, the Sooners have smashed the Tigers on the football field over the years. Let's be honest. So that's more of a feud than a rivalry, as Bill Simmons once pointed out. Well, you know what? Missouri and Oklahoma in basketball, that's much closer to an actual rivalry. Those are teams and programs that are relatively similar. And especially, man, the Norm Stewart era when he used to fight with their famous coach, whose name is escaping, Billy Tubbs. Hey, there it is in the dark recesses of my gray matter. For real, Billy Tubbs, Norm Stewart, some of the best basketball I've ever seen, some of the most entertaining basketball I've ever seen on the court and off. So to me, you've just got great history there with Oklahoma. So that would be a pretty obvious one too. But from the Sooners' perspective, clearly one of their rivals is going to be Texas. So is Missouri their obvious rival? Maybe, maybe not. Could it be Texas A&M? Could it be somebody like LSU is relatively close? I'm not completely sure. But what I would say, perhaps they want to play Arkansas. Maybe Arkansas and Oklahoma would also be a good permanent rival. So under those circumstances, there really isn't an obvious third team. Like if it's not Arkansas and Oklahoma, well, who is it if it's not the Sooners? Well, to me, under those circumstances, here would be my preference. The Kentucky Wildcats. Why? Because screw it. That's why. If we're going to play somebody every single year at Mizzou Arena, why not make it somebody who can potentially fill that place up? Yes, I understand. Again, you're looking at a, a likely loss a lot of times against Kentucky. Well, you know what? At a certain point, Missouri basketball has to put up or shut up. It's been at least 10 years now of, of Missouri basketball in the SEC. And when we entered this conference, lots of Missouri fans, myself included, were pounding their chest and going, you know what? We may take our lumps in football, but by golly, other than Kentucky, we should be as good as anybody in this conference. Obviously, that has not been the case so far. But at this point, would you rather play South Carolina every year or Vanderbilt every year or Tennessee might be a good one, I suppose. But again, geographically, Lexington closer than Knoxville. And also, from Kentucky's perspective, not exactly a lot of obvious SEC rivals for them either. Missouri, Kentucky, they have a border. They share a border, one of eight, obviously, that Missouri has. But from Kentucky's perspective, obviously, their number one rival is Louisville. Well, Louisville is in the ACC, so that can't be it. Who else? How about Tennessee? I think Tennessee is a great choice because the geography is there, obviously. And hey, for the league, Rick Barnes has obviously brought that program up a lot. Great exposure for the league. You have to, those those games, excuse me, those programs playing twice in a season is nothing but good exposure for the conference. But other than that, who is the obvious team? Is it Vanderbilt because of geography? I don't know that anybody's getting excited about Kentucky and Vanderbilt. But again, in theory, Missouri, a, a program that's been at one point or another, certainly a top 15 or top 20 program during its heyday, why can't Missouri basketball come back? Why can't Dennis Gates be the guy to do it? And if that's going to happen, let's nut up and play Kentucky. We, we geographically border the state. They're as close about as anybody other than Arkansas. So to me, the only downside is, oh, maybe an extra loss game or two against, a, again, a high team. But that's not really a downside either because you know how the NCAA tournament committee works these days. They give you more credit for losing to a really good team than they do for sort of barely beating a 200th ranked team or something like that. So to me, if it's not going to be Oklahoma, give me Kentucky. I'd love to know what you all think. And finally, one quick Missouri football note. Certainly in the last week or two, Missouri has signed some community college players that, frankly, I'm not sure are going to be major contributors. We'll just have to play that one by ear. But to me, the most notable signing that Missouri has done recently, especially for a very prominent member of the current team, is actually Blake Craig, a guy who is ranked as Cole's kicking number two kicker in the country in high school, well, he signed a letter of intent to play for your Missouri Tigers, or at least committed verbally very, very strongly on Twitter. That's just as good, right? That's just as good as the signature. But in all seriousness, it sounds like 
it sounds like Blake Craig is definitely going to be in the fold. And the fact that Missouri is willing to use a scholarship on him at this point for not this coming season, but the next, well, that tells me that it's quite possible that Harrison Mevis could walk after this season to the NFL. And you know what? I wouldn't blame him one bit because if Mevis has the kind of season this year that he's had the last two for Missouri and really no reason to believe that he won't, what else does he have to prove? Absolutely nothing, in my opinion. Really, the last thing that Mevis has to prove on the field in general is, does he have the leg to consistently kick the ball into the end zone in the NFL? And I think we saw a little bit of that in the spring game. Mevis got his opportunities. Obviously, they're splitting duties there. But I think that's the last thing for Mevis. If he can prove he can kick the ball off far enough, and well, that should be easy enough and and frankly, an off-the-field drills. He doesn't have to do that during a game. It's not like game pressure is the biggest thing there. But I don't know. To me, Mevis, as accurate as he is, as good of a leg as he has with, when the ball's on the ground, not necessarily on a tee, I, I just don't see what he has left to prove. I think he's an NFL prospect. And if I, had to, if I were a betting man, I'd say this is it for Harrison Mevis. This will be his last year in a Missouri uniform. I've been thinking that for a while, and especially with Drinkwitz going out and making this Blake kick, excuse me, this Blake Craig kid a priority, say that three times. I think that's a pretty in, good indication that Mevis is definitely thinking about it. And again, if he does it, good luck to him. I can't blame him whatsoever. And hey, thanks once again for making Locked on Mizzou your first listen today. Now make your second listen Locked on NBA Big Board, where they give fans an in-depth look into the biggest prospects in basketball, the latest rankings, and of course, Big Boards. Follow NBA Big Board every day on the Odyssey app, YouTube, or wherever, wherever you get the finer podcasts. So until next time, I'm John Miller, and this has been Locked on Mizzou.